I'm Bradley Vincent, curator at Hodder Gallery on the Gold Coast. Hodder Gallery is thrilled to be supporting local artists to make new work. Next year, we'll be putting 20 local artists and artist collectives on display on the largest stage that's ever been available in the city. When we called for submissions, we asked for artists to submit a proposal of their choosing. What has emerged in the 20 selected artists is a real connection to place. There is, amongst them, a rich interest in nature and the environment. Also, a reflection on development and our human impact on the environment and what we extract from it. And, optimistically, a look at the individual in relation to nature and how we might find space for reflection in the world around us. In this podcast series, members of the Hodder Youth Advisory Group will sit down for a one-on-one with these artists to talk about their practice, their background and the work they're making for Hodder in 2021. My name's Renee Belt and I look after education at Hodder for the Gallery and Visual Arts. And today I'm joined with Jay Jemine and CJ Anderson, who are both like the proud mama, I'm going to say part of the Youth Advisory Group, which is a group that exists at Hodder um, and helps out Sarah, who looks after public programming and myself um, in education. And again, very proudly, uh, CJ is part also of the exhibition group of artists that are going to be exhibiting at the gallery next year. And today we're just going to have some chat around uh, practice and process and what it's like to be an artist on the coast and how we approach these things. So I thought um, I'd kick things off by just asking, I get the sense you two know one another and have done yes. for a while. And um, yes, maybe you could tell me a bit about that or. So yeah, Jay and I went to uni together. So I grew up on the coast, lived around here and um we were both mature age students at uni, so I think uh, I used to be an electrician. Um, ah. Got sick of digging holes. Yeah, and I was in finance, and yeah, same thing. I was like, I wanted to pursue a creative career. So yeah, I think first one of our first classes. We were yeah, there. I remember it very distinctly. It was a uh, After Effects animation class. I walked in, and then CJ, I don't know, spotted me and just like walked straight up to me and was like, "Hi, I'm CJ." <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? And it's like I could tell he just was like I'm reaching out to someone yep. here. So yeah. I think I was, I was there to pursue my creativity and get people who are also there to be serious as well. So I think that was very much the <laughs> my final year. So I went through uni and I was I, I just tried everything. So I didn't really have a direction other than it was in industrial design, 3D design, that kind of approach. Um, my final semester, we had to do a portfolio and I kind of compiled all of my projects and I went, I don't actually like anything that I've done, <laughs> which is a you know tough realisation to come to. But I, I think I, saying that I didn't like it, I enjoyed the process and the underpinnings of what they gave me in terms of how to find what I like. Um, and that's when I decided to design a collection of furniture. Um, so I was... I, quite reached out and I, I wanted to do six pieces. I ended up finishing, completing three pieces of furniture. Um, the and then Stefan, the J yeah. and the, what was the other one? Oh. The third one, the Jack light, the Jack lamp. Yeah. So, and then, and I think that kind of then propelled me when we had our grad show um, with industry there and, and everyone else, it really, I think put a spotlight on what I could do um, very quickly and easily. And yeah, from that, then I, I got a, a job yeah. pretty quickly in the arts arts industry, luckily, um, for the UAP Urban Art Project. So, um, and that was an amazing, amazing experience. That was like the ultimate of my brain working in terms of a creative and manufacturing potential. So, um, working with artists to develop, you know, the world's largest art project. So, I do remember distinctly though, um, you still weren't quite feeling like you'd found your feet with your design style or no. your kind of artistic yep. practice yet. So, and that kind of leads us into um, a little undertaking that we took with a few other friends from uni, kind of responding to the Gold Coast, not having much of a design scene in yep. furniture and, and object design. Um, so we created this little group called Maker's Take, uh, which we put an exhibition on yep. in Burley. Um, and I think... That for me, I remember that was the turning point for you in yes. your practice, especially because 
you designed the Sonye. Yeah, Sonye. So I can, yep. can never pronounce it. Yeah, that's right. Sonye chair. Yeah. And it's just, I remember getting the render that you first sent me. Yeah. I thought it was like a pool chair. Yeah. And I thought it was going to be plastic. And you're like, no, I th- even I couldn't visualize it at that stage, but you obviously had that ability to, to visualize the the way the material is going to look yeah. in the re- in real life, not like off the computer. Um, and that really, I think that was the start of your style of, yeah, definitely of design, which is has influenced where I've gone and up until this point, um, and and kind of understanding who I am as a as a creative and an artist, a designer. Because um, I think looking at that piece on a surface level, when I'd first done it, was like for that show specifically, and there wasn't you know a lot of necessarily meaning attached to it in that very first point. Um, but I think I've got a bit of a reflective practice in terms that you know some objects that I create are from my mind that I don't necessarily have any meaning to them in the first instance when they're created. Um, and it's only over time that I kind of reflect and see why and where I was at that point in my life and what was happening. And with that chair, I'd had my first son, Leo. Um, and that chair kind of looks at the scale of how children see furniture um, and how children just see objects in general, um, cause it's quite an oversized piece. Um, and it's also like it's a play massive. gym as well. And it's, yeah. So I, I think <laughs> it takes over every room it's in. It does. It, it's, it's like, yeah. that's why I think it was received so well is because it's so big yeah. and it just, it kind of, you, you can't walk past it without looking at yeah. it. And, and, it, and I think the process statement. of that piece, so all majority of my work is developed with my dad as well. So he's a big influence in my life in terms of, you know, he's, been in the manufacturing industry making custom motorcycles so we worked on that chair together and developed that and we work on most pieces that I do as well um uh, he's self-taught machining welding all of the processes so I think I've got a really good underpinning of when I'm developing an idea um bringing it into the real world isn't really my problem it's normally you know really trying to push that conceptual and creative bounds mm. Yeah. So, do you think you maybe have him in mind when you're creating um, the next pieces that come after these? Two? Like each piece that comes next, do you think are you thinking about his manufacturing capabilities or what you've uh, seen him do in the past? Or I think maybe I think the big thing together? for myself is is challenging me and myself and my making skills because um, I think at the end of the day, what I want to be able to do is to be able to do all of these things myself. And I think that's potentially where I see my like art practice um, going is more exploring um, like emotional connection to materials. Having grown up in a machine shop, um, I remember walking around with, you know, metal shavings on the ground and all of those kinds of like aluminiums and stainless steels. That's like... How many do you have to pick out of your foot? Yeah, lots all the time. Yeah, because it's literally like the playground outside. Yeah. Yeah, so I like kind of grew up around motors and machines. Um, So I think for me, it's bringing an elegance and a softness to a lot of those pieces. Mm. And then sometimes also bringing the materials that are typically used in a heavy industrial sense to something that's not, where it's not typically put like an interior or a, Mm. you know, or a a chair or something along those lines. Yeah. So you just said something there about um, the material and kind of emotion. Yeah. Um, Do you want to kind of elaborate a little bit more with that, what you mean by that? Yeah, so I think that's where my latest pieces have been looking at is is how and questioning how do you embed emotion into material. Mm. Um, For me, I've got a very specific um, relationship to the materials. Um, Like everyone's going to see what I do in a different light, but the way I do it is is very much influenced by the relationship that I have with my father, um, you know, the person that I want to be in terms of a, a maker as well as... And also a, being a father yourself. As being a father myself, it kind of, you know, a lot of my processes, it's actually good having my son, Leo, along the ride with me because he kind of like... It is a ride with Leo. Right, yeah, completely. Yeah. Um, keeps him really like grounded as well in, in everything that I do. Um, and he, he kind of, I, I really like in, inviting him along as well so I mean he so a bit like a, pl- a bit of play with the material it's, it's, as well yeah, I think I think that's like my pieces kind of have that fun but serious nature I think that's where I see kind of my art practice going as well is is taking that 
approach mm. that, you know, very much it might be in the making process or the visual aspect of it that it looks fun yet serious kind of all at the same time and it could either fit in a space that, you know, it, it, it's just that fun and serious balance that I really look at, yeah. Yeah. So I guess you keep talking about your arts practice and your design practice. So yeah. we've had these two. So we started at uni with design, yep. still just exploring what your creative ideas are. Yep. Um, do you now start to see your arts practice, which is still really based in material, and yep. but a little bit more around exp- exploration, experimentation with material and all that kind of stuff? Um, do you see it being partnered with your design or, or yeah. are they kind of separate at the moment? I think mentally they're kind of just separate beings as the, as I don't necessarily when I'm creating my art objects, try and give them function out of pure purpose. Whereas my design practice, I know it's tough for you to do that. So (laughs) tough growing up in that world of manufacturing where everything has to have a purpose or else what's its point. Yeah. Um, but I think that's it's where pretty. Yeah, it's, it's pretty. pretty. Well, and, and I think that's, that, we that's still that. battle that with art though. It's like, what's the point? But then, but I think that's that connection to emotion that I want to put in there. Because for me mm. coming from an industry that's so heavily like functional and driven, that, that's, I think kind of where my work is heading is challenging those notions and kind of, creating pieces that can potentially speak to people that, you know, have people can have a connection to. Yeah. It's a, <laughs> I, I think splitting my practice is um, meant in my head helps me. Um, but I think one always influences the other and vice versa. Yeah. I feel exactly the same. Like I, um, in the last 12 months, I've had to really kind of separate, you know, the work that I do with my band people yeah. and the work that I do as an artist with Jay Jemine and they used to have always been collaborative and kind of bouncing back and forth fluid between the sound is informing the mm. artwork and all all over the place. But I feel like I've had to kind of separate those things a little bit now just to um, kind of really decide where things sit, but they definitely inform each other. So I fully understand what you're saying there. Like the, you've got your design, a little bit more commercial practice, yep. but then also this new stuff that's kind of happening. It's separate, but it's, still really informed well, I by think everything in the design. design in a typical world, everything has to, everything has a perceived value and everything has to have a commercial basis. So, you know, you make a chair, the chair has to be worth this much or else it's not acceptable. So I think my arts practice removes those for, for me personally in my head and allows me to kind of explore ideas which typically wouldn't move off the drawing board for the sake of it not being something that would sell. Mm. So these are just purely emotional explorations that I'm kind of looking at doing um, and not trying to bound them by any, any, any kind of cost analysis or marketing base or, you know, but, but, but I do know what will eventually happen is the finishes, the processes, the sizes, the materials will come back into the pieces that I create. It's just, I think, the, the way my head works is, is just in that ever, never ending like balance between form function and then also scale scale and, and having a, a, that, that outlet you like, I think for, for me, um, yeah, that's a really big thing is, is being able to have an outlet outside of, um, yeah, marketing, <laughs> mm. saleability. So it's like the, so I guess it's like the, you've got your processes and, and ways of doing things that are, really set in design, but you're kind of just using those processes to build like a sculptor yep. to build these works that you're going to be, you know, obviously creating for the, the new Hodig show that's going to be opening. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that that's it. it. It's kind of going back to my own roots and seeing what skills I have. Um, because I think uh, what I've, I'm, I'm good at is very much seeing an object or a, or a process and then trying to maximize it through design thinking and taking those processes. Mm. So this might, my, my art practice is kind of challenging manufacturing processes Yeah. to see how I can push those in a sense that's non-functional from, yeah, the front point, mm. which, which inside of me, I think we had this conversation earlier today. It was is, literally earlier today. Yeah. We, yeah. um, because we both come from yeah, either manufacturing like a trade base, 
it's everyone when you're talking about an art project kind of gets a raised eyebrow and a bit of a, what do you want to do that for? Mm. What do you want to hit that bit of metal for? And or what do you want to do that process or, for? Yeah. yeah. So I think stripping away the stigma, or, uh, this kind of comes to, for me down to a bit of a masculinity thing yeah. in the trade and manufacturing world where if you talk about your emotion, you know, if you yeah. you say, if you were to say on a construction site, I want to embed my emotions into this piece of stainless steel. Yeah. It's you, you really have to be really confident in saying that. Yeah. And I feel like we both are struggling with that transit, slow transition away from hugely manufacturing the trades um, into having more of an open dialogue around, you know, feelings. <laughs> <laughs>